Thank you, John. Um, well, we're starting a new month, and our MPC this month is George Cull. Uh, he's also our speaker today. Now, you know George because he sits in the back at the membership table. Uh, you also know George because he's a star in our TUG group and has educated us many times on many subjects, uh, including what I recall uh, some excellent coverage of 5G technology and other new tech. Uh, what you might not know is that uh, George is also Dr. Cull, uh, he with a PhD in electrophysics. Uh, he knows lasers and communication. And he's worked on the internals of Unix systems. On top of that, he's got a very strong background in simulation and modeling, which is very relevant to his talk today. Now, today he's going to speak about AI. Uh, now, you know, we're all aware now of all these AI things. It started out with algorithms, which are automated decisions. And then after a while, we started hearing about pattern work, like facial recognition. And now suddenly, we have what's called generative AI. That's the chat GPT thing. Uh, you can talk to it, and it can uh, create things. Uh, and it can even make art. And that's the topic today. Uh, there are always arguments about art, you know, uh, what is real art? You know, if you do something random, is that art? Well, now the, the argument is even bigger. You know, if a machine does it, is it art? Uh, George will speak to us about that. So please welcome George Cull. Thank you, Mark, for the nice introduction. Uh, let's get right into it. Um, uh, well, again, today's topic is about um, AI replacing art. Uh, my background, as uh, Mark mentioned, is pretty much in the sciences. But actually, I've been in, uh, in the art field and involved with it for a long time. Uh, it goes back to my great grandfather who was painting murals in churches in Lithuania. Uh, my father studied under George Lux, who is a famous American artist. Uh, he decided he was going to give up the uh, um, thought of becoming an artist and become a, uh, a, um, and become a, uh, an engineer instead. Uh, there was more money in it than, than in art. Um, my wife was an artist too, uh, painter and sculptor. Uh, my daughter has the art talent too. She's a great uh, uh, artist in sketching and stuff. And my son is an artist in sculpting. So <laughs> we, all, we all have, uh, uh, the whole family seems to be involved in art and uh, and uh, we all enjoy it. Uh, myself, I never could really get the hang of, of drawing and painting and stuff. Uh, so I went into photography. And some people claim that photography really isn't an art, but it is. Uh, again, you have to think about uh, um, all you know lighting and uh and uh form and and it is an art form uh so anyway uh the the next reason i became interested in, in uh in ai is uh that being a photographer i've been digitizing my uh all my slides and prints 
And as you know, when you digitize a print uh, from uh, a, uh, a printing and not a, um, a and, and not the original negative, you don't get very good resolution. And uh, so at the same time, I was reading about uh, programs that were being developed, research projects, using AI to improve the resolution and improve the uh, uh, the composition, the the uh, any of the defects in a photograph, and a actually able to fill in sections of photographs uh, that were missing, and uh, and actually color some of the photographs that were in black and white. And so I was able to download some of these programs and um, do uh, face restoration and improvement uh, that a lot of the standard programs couldn't do, uh, such as for all of for GIMP and a lot of the uh, other software that's available out there. Uh, at the same time, I had purchased a uh, MacBook Air with the M1 processor, and this is one of the new uh, laptops that has a, uh, a neural net chip built into it and a graphics card built into it. Uh, and it's quite powerful, and uh, I've been using that to do a lot of the AI that I've been playing with. Uh, and so I downloaded the software and started to run it. And uh, then recently in 2023, um, OpenAI released uh, the uh, sta stable diffusion model and uh, a um, automatic 1111 released their uh, web UI interface to that. Uh, which is open source and freely available. And you can actually run it on your home laptop. And, and that's what I've been running. And uh, the, uh, a almost all of the examples you'll see in this talk were uh, generated using that uh, software. And I have here breaking news. I was going to put a... Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the breaking news, uh, yeah, uh, right ringtone or something in it to, uh, to, to let everybody know that, uh, it's really breaking news. And the first item I have is the, uh, the letter that you've probably heard about last week, Elon Musk and, uh, other tech leaders are urging that they stop the AI, uh, releasing and uh, put a uh, put a halt to it for six months because it uh, presents a profound risk to humanity. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, could also be a reason that they're trying to uh, leap ahead with some other research. Uh, actually, this uh, afternoon, the tug meeting will be interesting to see how the uh, competition works out between the uh, different chat GPTs. Um, chat GPT-4 has been released, and it's about a thousand times more parameters and about a thousand times faster in training than the uh, chat GPT-3. Uh, the interesting thing is that they found out that as they increased the parameters, that the capabilities of the AI increase also. And, and I'll explain that in, in, a, in a later uh, slide. Uh, then you may have not heard, but uh, there was a, uh, when the AI was, when the stable diffusion had first come out, they had released uh, the software and somebody generated a photograph and placed it uh, in an art contest and it won first prize. And then when they found out it was generated by AI, 
uh, there were uh, a lot of complaints from the artists as to whether or not it was uh, legal to be in there and whether or not they should have given it the first prize. Um, the other thing is the economy. Uh, ChatGPT, for example, uh, will be taking away quite a few jobs. Uh, you have, for example, people who, uh, who generate copy. Uh, these are people who, for example, uh, write advertising blurbs, uh, uh, boilerplate stuff such as legal forms and things like that. Uh, there's no reason that ChatGPT can't do it. Uh, the other thing is with, um, with ChatGPT, uh, you hopefully will not have the human error involved. But as you'll see, you'll still get errors. It's still not perfect. Um, the other thing is uh, lawsuits. Because of uh, the threat that AI and uh, is, is generating towards uh, a lot of jobs, Getty Images, which provides quite a bit of stock photographs, so, for example, if you need for your uh, advertising uh, a woman holding a cup of coffee, you would go to Getty Images and say, I need a picture of a woman. You describe the woman where, and, and they would have that photograph uh, somewhere in their database and be able to give it to you, well, sell it to you. Uh, now with AI, you don't need them. You can go ahead and put the text in and generate that image and not pay them a, a dime. Well, the lawsuit that they've been filing claims that, well, the AI was trained using their art, that the pictures uh, were used and are in, in the AI and therefore uh, that it's a copyright infringement uh, that's a battle that will be very interesting to see uh, because as you will see again in in a future slide that they're not really storing the picture itself in the in the uh, ai it's other information and <clears throat> and also artists are suing uh the ai companies uh, for being parasites, uh, re using their work for free. In other words, uh, with AI, you can say, I would like it in the style of, of a famous artist, uh, and it will generate a picture and modify it to be in that style of the artist. Uh, the, they're claiming that, well, it's my style, and therefore you're copying that style. Um, they, again, this is a lawsuit that will be very interesting to follow and see how it uh, turns out. Uh, why all this buzz all of a sudden? And the real answer is that generative AI has gone through an exponential evolution. Uh, it, it has been a... Um, a software that that has been slowly building, but all of a sudden, uh, as machine horsepower, computing power has increased dramatically, storage has increased dramatically, and algorithmic developments have increased dramatically, that the generative AI has really exploded and and uh, been able to accomplish all these tasks. Um, it, what it does is it's a simple user interface that allows them to create um, high quality text, graphics, video, audio, synthetic data. Uh, what I mean by synthetic data is, for example, uh, protein mapping, uh, um, uh, folding, uh, 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 drug synthesis, uh, a lot of other types of uh, 
automated AI created information. Uh, it uses a high, highly efficient model to train itself. The big thing is that you want a model that you don't have to sit down and train in that you don't want to have human interaction training the model. You want the model to be able to train itself. And that was one of the big breakthroughs that had come through. Uh, and also, as I mentioned with hardware, uh, the computers and phones now, as of probably two years ago, all typically have a high power graphics card or a neural engine built in. And uh, I had just bought recently the uh, Apple iPhone 14. And much to my surprise, uh, when I was loading on my Mac, a piece of software for AI generation, it appeared on my phone and it works on the phone. So I can actually do image generation on my phone. And it's relatively fast. Uh, I have here some famous quotes on art. And you'll see how these quotes relate to the talk today. Um, <laughs> uh, Michelangelo had quite a few of them. Uh, a man paints with his brains and not with his hands. And uh, if you think about AI, it's basically painting with his hands, but it also has a brain. And hopefully it's not just a straw brain. Um, and then he also made the other famous quote, every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it's the task of the sculptor to discover it. Uh, and then finally, uh, the famous monkey uh, theorem, uh, which states that a monkey hitting a key at random on a typewriter keyboard for an infinite amount of time will almost surely type any given text such as the complete works of Shakespeare. And actually, the infinite monkey theorem has been proven and is correct. So when you get an infinite number of monkeys, they can challenge uh, Shakespeare. Um, what I have tried to show here are the qualities that make a human artist uh, an artist, uh, the ability to allow them to output fine art or reasonable art, or even in my case, meh, art. <laughs> um, the first thing is talent. You really need the talent to do it. If you draw a, a figure and it looks like the typical stick figure, uh, Maybe you should go into photography. Uh, it, it, the other thing is creativity. And that is something that is really uh, ambiguous. And uh, as you'll see, we'll talk about it as, it, as uh, a, does AI really have creativity or not? And it's, it's interesting in that um it's an amorphous uh quality which which becomes difficult to define the next thing is imagination uh you, you really need to be able to uh think about it uh a lot of us are in the sciences uh and we know that when we we're solving a problem We'll think about it, mull it over, forget about it, go back to it, uh, go back, uh, and it will uh, go. You'll go ahead and uh, decide that um, the uh, the that eventually, hopefully, you'll get the solution. Uh, but again, it, it's the ability to go back and reanalyze and reanalyze uh, that in different ways, looking outside the box, 
and being able to um, come up with new ideas. Uh, the next thing I have is passion. And if you don't love art, you're not going to become an artist. Uh, you'll do something else, just like sciences. If you don't love sciences, you're not going to be a scientist. If you don't love math, you're not going to become a mathematician, uh, et cetera. And the last, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that the ones in the cloud are these ambiguous amorphous qualities that really are hard to define. Uh, and the last one I have there is luck. Um, if, if you become an artist, uh, you know, you have to have luck that your work is discovered. Uh, you, you have a lot of cases of the starving artist, the uh, artist who's only discovered after his death. Uh, all those are quite true, and it all runs because of luck. Uh, the, the, the real hard qualities are training. And again, uh, you really have to practice, practice, practice. Uh, and that grows your skill also. You become a finer and better painter. Uh, you get to know colors, you get to know composition and all those things. And then finally, you have inspiration um, that you really have to, you want to have the, the idea of what you want to paint or draw. Uh, and something has to inspire you to generate that. Uh, you have artists who go through phases uh, where some will be inspired uh, by a specific uh, uh, lifestyle. For example, George Lukes was known for the Ashcan school of painting uh, because he would paint uh, street pictures in the late 18... Uh, 1800s, early 1900s of the uh, street vendors and coal miners and uh, those types of people. There we go. And here I have the qualities of an AI artist. Uh, one thing is unexpected capabilities. And as you'll see, because of the way the art is generated, that the um capabilities of ai have grown such that you can come across unexpected results uh they discovered that chat gpt for example could go ahead and figure out how to um to uh write uh software and check software when it really wasn't uh designed to do that uh, they also, also found out that it could um, uh, solve mathematical theorems and problems when it wasn't taught what math was or what theorems were. Uh, so it was able to figure all that out by itself. So I do show creativity as one of these amorphous qualities, and, and again, we'll get into it. Uh, the next thing is skill growth. That is just algorithm. Skill growth is the way you develop the algorithm to have the ability to go ahead and generate the results you want. And what I mean by the results you want is to be able to form the type of re output that you're looking for. And the next thing is the training data. Uh, you need data to input and go ahead and generate the, uh, the artwork. And that is basically the learning experience that the AI needs to go through. Computing power is another powerful thing that is needed by AI. Uh, and again, with the increasing uh, power of AI, we have better and better uh, results. And then finally, input. You need a prompt. You need something to trigger AI. It doesn't 
do it by itself. It's not there thinking while you're not uh, asking a question or prompting it for an answer or a picture. As I mentioned, generative AI is um, a is the generic, or I'll say, uh, uh, Genesis name of the AI that is being used by uh, ChatGPT and Stable Diffusion, uh, the um, all, all those types of programs, and um, what it does is it takes training data and runs it through an algorithm and creates brand new content, brand new data. Uh, it has its roots in deep learning, convolutional neural networks, natural language processing, and recurrent neural networks. Uh, the field of AI is one of the fields like the Army and like NASA and the government. It has so many acronyms that you you will probably have to look them up every time. Uh, it, it's just a uh, uh, just a a nomenclature of acronyms throughout. The next best, next thing that generative AI depends on was transformers. Uh, as you know, the T in Chat GPT is stands for transformers. And this is the ability to transform one set of symbols into another set of symbols. And now I said symbols, which is important because you don't want to work on fixed symbols such as alpha as a language with alphabets or numbers. If you take it to symbols, you can work on anything. You could work on pictures. You could work on glyphs. You can work on languages. You could work on sounds. So it becomes independent of the input medium. Uh, the other thing is uh, unsupervised learning. You don't want to have to sit there and keep feeding and teaching uh, the AI that show it a picture of a banana and say, this is a banana, this is a grapefruit, this is a monkey, this is a human. Uh, you wanna just let it go on its own and, and discover uh, its own training. And what you also need is a way to be able to capture all this data that it's learning and represented in some form of data that can easily be represented in a relatively small amount of space. And that's latent space. And what this is, it takes all the information that it's learning, runs it through the algorithm or the model, and then generates uh, a latent space uh, uh, which is a lower dimensional representation of the input. Uh, the evolution of generative AI is that in 1966, uh, Liza uh, came out. I, I, I'm sure some of you here in the audience have played with it at one time or another. I, I know in, in graduate school, it was a, 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 a very popular item. Uh, in 2006, ImageNet database was set up. This was a, uh, a database of images that were uh, titled with English text. So you had a, a text to image uh, database. In 2011, Apple released Siri, uh, which I still have complaints about. <laughs> in 2015, uh, deep un unsupervised learning uh, with using non-equilibrium thermodynamics came out. And this, actually, this was one of the first papers that really caught my interest in that what they do is they introduce noise to an image and generate by 
going through and iterating on the image, a completely noise filled pattern. And then by running it backwards through the algorithm, they can actually take the noise out and come back with the original image. And, and that was one of the first things uh, where they were able to do in painting, where you can fill missing parts of an image. And then the research paper uh, that was released by Google titled, Attention is All You Need, uh, uh, came out. And that was the uh, development of transformers. And again, that was another major leap forward. And then in 2018, Google released BERT, OpenAI released ChatGPT, and uh, OpenAI in 2021, OpenAI released DALI, again, a, a takeoff on uh, the, uh, the cartoon and uh, Salvador DALI's names. And, um, and then in 2022 is when OpenAI released uh, uh, Stable Diffusion, and again, uh, it just took off. There are so many places where you can get models, you can get uh, anything you could think of, they're generating it right now. Just to give you an idea what a transformer does, here's an example of translating from English to French. And there, it's not just a word for word translation because French relies on, it also relies on position. And so what you do is you set up a matrix, a simple matrix, and then you put the weights of the uh, language, the translation in the matrix. And the lighter the, uh, the element of the matrix, the more probable it is that the that's the position and the translation of the item. And uh, this is really the 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 whole uh, ability of the uh, open AI uh, that came out. Uh, this, what I, I'm trying to show here is the training flow chart of, of the, um, of the uh, open AI, of, of the AI, generative AI. Uh, what it does is it takes training data, it tokenizes it, so it's converting it to a symbol in that, in that step. Uh, once it's in a symbol, as a symbol, it doesn't care what it is. You then put it through an encoder, which is the model, which is a, um, a neural net, which goes ahead and picks out, looks for patterns, uh, looks for rules, and compresses the data into a lower dimensional space, which is the latent space. And then that vector is then stored and used and imprinted into the latent space. The way it, generative, it generates images is, again, it, you input a prompt, which in this case, I use a realistic photograph of an astronaut riding a zebra on Mars. <laughs> again, it tokenizes it and then puts it through an encoder. Once it goes through the encoder, it then generates a vector which then projects into latent space and it pulls out the data in that latent space and then pulls it into a decoder. Now, once it's in the decoder encoder, it then iterates through using a seed of some sort and then generates the output image. And when I say through iterations, again, it's checking it against what the original uh, request was. And in this case, an astronaut riding a zebra on Mars. And you might not be able to see it clearly, but it's pretty pretty uh, realistic and, uh, and does meet all the uh, criteria. And by the way, it was generated on my phone.
here I have a uh, another uh, prompt, a color photo of the robot artist painting the Mona Lisa canvas on easel, Renaissance style studio, colorful. And what you see happening here is you see the initial image, which looks like all noise. That's the seed. Once the seed is is set off, it goes through the algorithm and starts subtracting the noise and comparing it to the request. And as it does it, it improves the image after every iteration. And as you can see here, see here the final iteration is relatively accurate to what I requested. And there are a whole bunch of, of tricks that you can do. For example, you notice the uh, the uh, robot artist is in parentheses with a weighting factor. This says, put a little more attention here. I want a robot artist, not, if you don't do that, you might get a, uh, a real human artist painting it instead. Uh, and in the Mona Lisa, it, it was interesting. It took me a while to actually get it to paint a robot painting the Mona Lisa. The original picture I wanted was, uh, it was um, a painting of a robot painting a painting of of da Vinci painting the Mona Lisa. It would paint da Vinci painting the Mona Lisa. It would paint a robot painting the Mona Lisa, but it would never go to a robot painting a painting of a painting. I uh, still got to figure that one out. Here uh, I'm comparing uh, what, the, what creativity uh, can compare to AI and comparing it to uh, what humans have to uh, to be able to learn creativity. The first thing I have here is sentient. Uh, I really think that it's hard for for you to um, not have uh, not have true art without being sentient. You, you really have to have passion, emotion. Uh, all those things that really, uh, so far, AI hasn't been able to learn. Uh, diverse experiences. Uh, and here I put a yes, because you can train it to be an artist like Picasso, like Dali. Uh, any artist you can think of, you can train it to become that type of artist. You can even combine artists. You can say, uh, I want a uh, painting like Monet uh, and and dolly and give them different weights and it'll come up with a new style and never be seen never before seen style uh encouragement and support i put a yes here too uh because it is feedback it is learning so that if it is not correct it goes back and relearns and recorrects itself until it gets the uh, the correct uh answer play and exploration i put yes and no um playing it's a difficult thing and the reason i gave it a yes and no is that you can the human plays with it and in a way i think that the ai learns from that and uh so as we go through we get to see how the AI reacts to our different inputs. And, and it truly is a learning process. And uh, so exploration maybe is a no and play is maybe a yes. So uh, yes and no. Uh, practice and persistence. And of course, yes, that's the whole concept of training. Uh, collaborative work, no, you're not going to uh, uh, be getting any uh, thoughtful insight from a, an AI that will give you, uh, allow you to work together on solving a problem. Uh, mindfulness and reflection, again, is a no. It, it has no concept of, uh, 
of of really the id or any any uh, idea like that. Uh, the impact on human uh, jobs. I have here copywriters, as I mentioned before. Uh, this is a, a big area, uh, and as you've seen, ChatGPT can do it quite efficiently. Uh, illustrators, again, another area where they're going to be uh, really replacing uh, those jobs. And the uh, stock photo suppliers, again, you need a, uh, a photo of a specific item, and, and there it is. Um, just for fun, I asked ChatGPT, what are the limitations of generative AI? And this is a condensed ver uh, answer that it gave me. Generative AI has made impressive advances in recent years, particularly with the development of deep learning and neural networks. However, there are still some limitations that affect the performance and potential of these systems. Uh, one, quality of generated content. And with the different types of images I was able to generate, you see that maybe 10% of the images are uh, worth keeping. <laughs> the rest are just uh, garbage. Uh, it depends on training data. If you don't, it, it can figure out that a zebra and a horse are similar, but it can't figure out if it doesn't know what an octopus is, how to generate an octopus. It has to be trained with something like that. It lacks, again, creativity and intuition. Uh, it, it's just following the algorithm. Uh, limited understanding and of context and semantics. Again, if it doesn't, uh, if you don't phrase it correctly, it's not going to really understand what you want. And then finally, ethical concerns, um, spreading disinformation. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that. Here, uh, I was invited to the White House and uh, uh, a friend of mine was actually working for Trump. And this is a picture of uh, where Trump decided that instead of going through a vote in 2020, that he and Biden would arm wrestle for the White House. <laughs> and, and as you can see here, yeah, they're, they're doing it. So it must be true. Of course, now the FBI is probably going to be looking after me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, notice that. The, you can tell some of the things that you'll notice here. If, if you look closely at the hands, that's one thing AI is still having a difficulty at, generating fingers and hands correctly. Uh, the other thing is, whoops. The other thing is, um the facial details again i was using just the information that the model i used to generate this had i wasn't using they actually have people have gone ahead and trained uh little uh embeddings where you can embed information into the latent space for joe biden and donald trump and that would give a better representation of them. So this was just what what the uh, the current uh, 2.1 model had in in its uh, latent space. Uh, it got the 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 uh, desk fairly correct. Um, so again, it, it was a uh, an interesting exercise. And it took probably, uh, again, one out of 10 pictures that were reasonable enough to generate this picture. And this is the program, uh, the web UI that you use. And if you look over here, I don't expect you to really see all the detail here. Oops. But 
what you have are all the parameters that you use to to adjust and change the picture and one of the big ones is the seed and typically you set that as a random number and then generate four or five pictures and then when you get one that's close to what you like you use that seed and start adjusting the other parameters to tone it to uh, zone it into the uh, picture the final picture you want so it's not really automatic you still have to go ahead and uh, play with it quite a bit uh so getting back to the original question will ai replace the artist not yet but just wait uh the the ability for the web ui and for stable diffusion to go from when it was first released as open source package in september of last year till today has just been a very dramatic increase as i mentioned we you now have it on your phone you have it uh on all different platforms it's really becoming easily available. And that's it. Now, now I expect we'll be having a lot of questions and might even run over into Tug. <laughs> Mitch. So I love the uh, astronaut on a zebra on Mars, <laughs> but I want an astronaut on a Palomino on Mars. All right. Does it go all the way back to the beginning and start over when you ask it that question or do you, does it, would it be like, like you do with uh, uh, Photoshop or some and take the zebra out and put in the Palomino? Actually, you could do it both ways okay you understand i mean yes that's, i mean yes this, what I, this what, is a variant on the question yes what what this web ui has is the ability to not only do text to image but image to image and in image to image you can do uh you can fill in uh missing areas you can do uh fill you can actually extend the picture. You can uh, you could actually have it paint what's outside the original frame of the picture. So yes, it, it does that have it does have that capability. Next question. I, I was curious about your remark that uh, you need a prompt, and I'm wondering if it's possible to prompt it to generate its own prompts so that it is it is sitting there doing thinking of some sort. Uh, you know, go go come up with ways to improve yourself and report back every 24 hours <laughs> or something like that. Is that is that possible? Actually, people have been playing with that using chat GPT and stable diffusion. Uh, they've gotten some interesting results, but it's a work in progress right now. Bill Tittle. Yeah, George, thank you very much. It's probably the best discussion I've had of this chat GPT. And you, you go to the Wall Street Journal or Times, they don't get into any of this really guts of the matter. Uh, I've got, I think, three concerns. Obviously, um, uh, truth worries me because I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's making mistakes and you. It, you may think it's just not going to make mistakes anymore, but it may only take one to do a lot of damage. And the second is the notion of um, creativity. Uh, it reminds me of consciousness. We don't know. We don't know what consciousness is. I mean, we experience it, but we don't know what it is. 
And uh, since similarly with creativity, we, we, we know what we do, but I think the logical conclusion of all this is machines that are gonna take us over. Well, uh, re remember you always can go and pull the plug <laughs> until they figure out how to generate their own electricity. <laughs> um, so you, now you're clearly not worried about this. No, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I, you know, it's it's like fusion. Fusion is always five years away, or ten mm -hmm. years away. Uh, sentient AI is the same thing. It, mm -hmm. Everybody is claiming it's here when it's really not. Uh, the one thing that's missing is that it has to be a continuous AI. In other words, it has to be continually on, it has to be continually learning and continually setting up its latent space. There's a, there's a good reason I drew the two brains because the brains really showed uh the latent space our brain people think uh is like latent space compared to ai and mm -hmm. the way we store memories and and then build from the uh information that's stored in the latent space again remember it's a condensed uh information and generate the final result just one last follow up, if I may. Um, you have any sense of the economics of this? I mean, this is a lot of training and thousands of people doing stuff and getting these things to know what to do. Um, it's not going to be free. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, for example, um, Stable Diffusion, which was released as an open source package, uh will remain free and what you have is you have uh the open source community out there in, in their free time building models generating images improving the code so uh it, it is advancing and uh i expect it to stay free uh chat gpt is another case remember that model is uh, locked down by OpenAI and is not released, and therefore uh, you can figure out the algorithms that it uses, but it wouldn't be the same. Okay, thanks very much. Great job. Uh, I'm curious about the logical abilities of AI today. Uh, now, You've, you've shown us how you could uh, put in a lot of parameters and the AI can handle that. Uh, that's clear. But have you, have you presented the AI with what you might call a difficult logical demand? Uh, you know, saying, uh, if the zebra comes out with stripes of this kind, change it to that, you know. And on the other hand, if it doesn't do the following three things, you know, things, statements like that. Now, I've seen in magazine articles, I've seen an appearance that the, at least the chat GPT can do elementary logic, but it never seems very sophisticated. Have you any experience of that? Yeah, yeah. The um, uh, people have written extensions for the uh, stable diffusion, for example, which allows you to do simple prompt logic. In other words, uh, from a result, go back and change the uh, the prompt. So, yeah, people, uh, you know, when it's open source like me they're going to start hacking it to death and really become addictive and make it do what they want it to do online fad Gabera. yeah hi uh hi, 
Oh, you can hear me. Great. Well, thanks a lot for your wonderful talk. And, uh, you know, things have certainly progressed since we were at Bell Labs when we used to meet at the thermal printer yeah. to get our results. <laughs> and you have to walk halfway across the building to get it. <laughs> and here you are uh, right now with this machine that can do these wonderful things. Now, besides the art aspect, there is also the AI in concern with patents. And they want to cons and people have already submitted a patent done by an AI machine about two or three years ago. And the patent office rejected it. Actually, it didn't even get to, to the patent office. It was rejected. And then they um, went up to appeals and finally it was rejected. Uh, but now, two months ago, the patent office has requested a new proposal on AI. And they want to consider whether or not AI can be an inventor. And if there is a lot of push for it, the, uh, the, they can't, the only way that that would be able to occur is they got to go to the statures and they'll have to go to Congress to change one of the rules that's uh, USC 100. And currently it says individuals who invented the subject matter of the invention and individuals is a human being. They'll have to go back to Congress and alter that law. And once they do, AI may very well become um, uh, an inventor. And in a way, that's a step forward for it to be sent sentient as well. Uh, and uh, uh, so what do you think about that? I, I agree with you, but presently, it really doesn't have that ability. And I think of AI right now to be more of a tool than its own inventor. So you should find the person who inputted the prompt to generate the, uh, the uh, patentable material. And that should be uh, what is, um, uh, that person should be the person who gets the patent. I see. Well, well, we'll see how this turns out with the patent office, but there's also another concern. There's something known as the basilisk. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So once the artificial intelligence, once fully emerged and becomes uh, sentient, will retroactively punish all those who did not contribute to its effort to become sentient. And I, Elon is at the front of the list. Uh, that, 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 I believe that, in it. <laughs> that, that's why you have to be deep in the code and make sure you put in those trap doors. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, George. <laughs> thanks, Dad. Thank you for a great talk. I have this terrible negative feeling about not only AI, but modern computing, that things like medical research, financial analysis, sports analysis, all kinds of things which are you can put down in numbers and symbols fairly easily. The analysis of these things is done by people making good money. And if I'm running a business nowadays, I'm always looking to make to save money on people. And don't you think they're going to deploy tools like this and lesser tools towards the elimination of white collar jobs? I, I don't think it'll be the elimination. I think it'll be a change. If I'm sorry. Uh, may I interrupt you? Sure. If you do something to eliminate work, which sensible business managers do, if they can automate 20, 30 CPAs out, they probably will. They may have contracts and whatnot. I don't know, but. The idea that there's some limit on this, I really don't accept. The idea that if you're going to eliminate work, somehow other work magically appears, I, I think needs to be at least proven to me. And I'm sorry for interrupting and thank you again. Sure. Uh, well, you've seen it, you know, for example, in the space program, they had whole rooms full of people doing calculations. And that was all replaced by a computer. So, and then in the stock market, for example, uh, back in the 90s, 
you had the quants invade the stock market and they were replacing a lot of the analysts. So you, you do have situations where new technology forces a change in, in the uh, work, uh, workplace. Uh, I really don't see it replacing everybody. Uh, not until it, it really becomes sentient and then has some ability to manufacture and reproduce. That's when you start worrying. Kelly Hill. Uh, George, thank you for a brilliant and informative talk. I've been playing with chat GPT-3 and I've been asking it to write awk programs for me. <laughs> the last thing I asked it to write was to create an awk program that would eliminate redundant lines in a file. So it presented the eight character awk program that does it and explained how it worked. I was totally blown away by this. So programmers beware. But, yes. <laughs> but, but my real question is, as an educator, what should we be teaching students so they won't be obsoleted by AI in the future, that they'll have jobs, profitable jobs in the future? Have any thoughts? Uh, I think a couple of things. One is uh, to be able to uh, be able to rapidly uh, learn new things. So the ability to quickly learn something and figure out how it works and to be able to use it is going to be an important talent that I think the uh, the employers are going to be looking for. Um, and again, the whole reason we get educated in these days is to be able to earn a living. Um, for for general, I, I would say that the general, the, I'll call it the liberal arts community, needs to be made aware of it and, and actually learn how the process works and not to be afraid of it. And I, I think that would go uh, a long way in, in improving their skills and improving their ability to compete against it. I like those suggestions. Thank you. Thanks, Al. My question, um, if you did a, a freehand graph of a numerical relationship, <coughs> excuse me, could could chat, could the uh, AI uh, shape that up and make it look nice? Uh, it, it, you're saying that you wanted to clean up a hand drawn yeah. plot? Yes. Yes, it, it could. It could even change it into instead of using a line. It could use uh, whatever it's the plot of. So it could use atoms, it could use uh, stars, it could use monkeys typing at a typewriter. But yes, it, it can clean up pictures. Uh, actually, th there is a way, I, I didn't do it because of time, but I could have drawn a stick figure of a robot painting the picture of Michelangelo painting the Mona Lisa. And it would have then generated that picture. George, I really enjoyed this, but uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> yes. Uh, and and I looked at the. I was with you until I saw the picture of uh, uh, two two uh, significant uh, leaders arm wrestling. And my background's in political science, <laughs> and I was it, I found it shocking. To look, some people thought it was very funny, and I caught I caught the humor in it, but I I thought it was shocking, and it just occurred to me the 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 in the political climate that we arrive that we're in right now that where we're where things are so polarized uh and uh, emotionalized and uh I'm, I'm i fear that that uh this tool can be used for propaganda purposes uh that it uh and we've opened up the world i mean we've got the level playing field where you don't need a journalist anymore anybody can offer an opinion and it goes to tens of millions of people, people that have never thought about an idea before. And suddenly they have an image and images are very powerful. So I was kind of chilled by the potential. And it could be used by revolutionaries. It could be used by autocrats or anybody in, or just idiots in between. 
or just humorous, but uh, but the potential to generate images that can be seen by so many people uh, uh, chills me. I, I grew up in a world where where ethically we were taught to to rely upon experts, uh, and uh, that uh, you, if you, you you needed to know the source of the information to evaluate it. Right. Uh, and yeah. and and I see here, I don't see a source, so that troubles me. No, that's very true. Uh, and to be honest, it's been going on for at least 10 years, if not longer. The only difference now is the average person can do it compared to a government or a big organization. Uh, you've all heard the term deep fakes. And, you know, they've been around quite a while. And uh, all the AI art that's being done in movies, uh, again, that's all this type of, of, of work. Uh, for example, when uh, Trump announced his uh, indictment, uh, the next day there were tons of pictures on the internet showing him being arrested on the ground, being handcuffed. Those were all generated using probably stable diffusion. It's uh, a lot of thirty five. Like one more question. I kind of wanted to go back to the original question. Mm -hmm. You said that uh, AI will not be replacing art yet and wait. And I'm an engineer, but I look at it, it my answer we say never. I think the reason being that is that the uh, artificial intelligence goes to creating perfection looking to imitate human, where human is trying to be perfecting to a machine perfection. But creativity uh, or human is that if you ask the same, uh, the, the same artist to draw a same picture twice or three times, three or those pictures were all different slightly. But where uh, AI will make it perfect, unless you change the algorithm, it will be perfect every time. So it's very to air is to human. So you, you will never be replacing artists. I think the more concern is what Vito was saying, the AI is changing the reality. I think the artist should not be afraid of AI replacing art because art is based on in individuality where I think in China, if somebody rec recognize a, a, a writing, okay, they will say that, oh, that's a famous so-and-so's writing. But if our AI, he can create anybody's, right? He mm -hmm. cannot establish his own and where the, the picture or the character is stick to a person's, <laughs> that individual's character, where the AI, is trying to create perfection and is almost like copying or perfecting someone's someone's uh, creativity or some someone's product. Yes, I agree. I just, I think, that, just, I think that the answer that you have is coming from a scientist and not coming from an artist. Uh, right? Yeah, I, I I would agree on that, uh, but. Right now, AI is a tool. It, it, it's being used, by. it can be used by artists. It can be used. And, and one correction, it, it does not, it does not uh, reproduce the exact same thing. Um, because of the latent space concept, uh, it's actually generating the image from that latent space. So you're going to have noise coming in there and you're going to have variation, but you are correct that if you put in all the same parameters and the same seed, you're going to get the same result. All right. Uh, George, that was one of the clearest, uh, most coherent uh, explanations that we've had um uh 
and uh, I really appreciated it very much. And of course, we have this this thing. Uh, this was generated by Tom Tobin Tom GPT. GPT. Uh, uh, and uh, it has this uh, curious colored shape on it. Uh, I I'd like to explain it, but I'd I'd rather just yeah. let GPT do it. Uh, so please accept this for our appreciation you, for your wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you. It's time.